Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, continuing the last exchange, uh, and I hope we do get a chance to hear from the member for Toronto Centre again uh, tonight. It is astonishing to hear the Liberal Party, which complained about national caveats during our forces' time in combat in Afghanistan and in Kandahar, which pushed for NATO command of that mission starting in 2003, and then Canadian command of the first NATO combat mission in southern Afghanistan in 2005-2006. That same Liberal Party, now in opposition, have become the stern daughter of the voice of God on the whole question of whether interoperability can actually be made a practical reality. They didn't want to apply these principles of pulling Canadian troops out of US units, not having Canadian pilots who may be based with US squadrons provide air, air support to uh, US units that might need it because of the danger of cluster missions. They didn't raise any of those concerns, even while this convention was under negotiation at that time, because in the heat of combat, most of them wanted the best for our troops and wanted our troops to do well. Now, they knew very well, very quickly, that they had sent the Canadian forces into Afghanistan under-equipped, without the right uniforms, without the right vehicles, without the right mobility, tactical, strategic lift, that this country with its expeditionary tradition should always have. And they were embarrassed for it. And they were called on it. And they will wear their reputation and their record of a decade of darkness, the lowest ebb of support for the Canadian forces for the rest of their history, Mr. Speaker. But the hypocrisy that we've seen tonight on this issue of cluster munitions and exceptions of a party that wanted us to go and lead the first NATO combat mission in one of the most difficult theaters imaginable, now wanting to fetter those same forces with an inability to work comprehensively with their US colleagues uh, and to be good allies, to, not, to be one of the few countries that doesn't have those caveats, that doesn't shy away from combat when it's necessary, when it's authorized, when it's the right thing to do. It's astonishing, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I think his comments, the member for Toronto Sanders, probably does more to advance our case for this legislation as the right legislation to govern our involvement in the Convention on Cluster Munitions at this stage in our history, while the United States is still on a different path than anything that I'm about to say. But Mr. Speaker, let me say a few things from a Department of National Defense perspective, uh, from the perspective of the Canadian Armed Forces, about this important legislation. And let's just remind ourselves what those Canadian forces are still doing at home and abroad that brings them into contact with Canadians on all three coasts and across this great country, with allies, with many of the countries the member for Toronto said or mentioned many of whom sent contingents to Afghanistan, but who didn't have the size, the scale, or the capability to do the heavy lifting that countries like Canada did. Our troops have responded just in the last year to natural disasters like floods in Quebec and the prairies, forest fires in British Columbia, a hurricane in Atlantic Canada. They support law enforcement agencies when called upon. They patrol our Arctic. They con conduct search and rescue missions. We discuss those missions almost every week in this House of Commons. And they do it on some of the most inhospitable terrain and climate on Earth. Abroad, our men and women in uniform have been heavily committed to the mission in Afghanistan. First, protecting Kabul, the capital, while our allies were off on another mission in Iraq. Secondly, in combat in Kandahar, bringing NATO forces into a pitch, a tempo of operations that they'd never seen before in the history of the alliance and now training the Afghan National Security Forces. They protected civilians in Libya. They're engaged in counter-narcotics missions in the Caribbean Basin and Eastern Pacific. They're helping foster maritime security in the Arabian Sea. And let's recall, Mr. Speaker, HMCS Toronto and its seizures of heroin, of opium, of hashish on historic scales, on a scale that allied navies have never before achieved. 
We're also participating in a number of international missions from Cyprus to Golan to South Sudan. More and more, the forces find themselves working in complex, sensitive, legally challenging theaters of operation. There is no rule of law in many of these states, in many of these societies, when these missions are undertaken. And that's why the, these Canadian forces, and indeed the new authorities in many of these countries, are looking to international law, including conventions, agreements, and other treaties to guide their actions. One of these, Mr. Speaker, is the Convention on Cluster Munitions which Canada signed in good faith four and a half years ago. The bill before us will allow Canada to ratify that treaty. But even though the convention hasn't yet entered into force here in Canada, and this is a key point, Mr. Speaker, national defense and the Canadian forces have already taken clear st steps to abide by its spirit. First and foremost, it's important to recognize that the forces have never used these weapons in any of their operations. Mr. Speaker, that, if anything, we say tonight deserves repetition. It's surely that fact. The Canadian forces, with their record of success, in world wars, in peacekeeping, in Korea, in Afghanistan, have never had recourse to cluster munitions. And even before Canada signed the convention, three years before, in fact, the forces began to phase cluster munitions out of their operational weapon stocks, where they had remained unused. And it wasn't long after that that the forces began ridding themselves of these weapons entirely, a process nearly complete, now that Public Works and Government Services Canada has posted the last contract for the destruction of our remaining stock of cluster munitions. Now, while this process of stock destruction was underway, the Chief of the Defence Staff underscored the forces' position on these weapons by prohibiting their use in any of our military operations. The fact that all this took place before Canada even signed the Convention shows our commitment, the Canadian Forces' commitment, to its aims. Monsieur le Président, c'est parce que nous reconnaissons que le type de coopération internationale qui mène à des accords comme la Convention engendre un monde plus sécuritaire et mène par extension à une plus grande sécurité pour le Canada. The Canadian Forces have always been strong supporters of the arms control and disarmament regime. It helps to keep the world an orderly, more peaceful place where fewer military operations are required. Mais bien entendu, ce genre de coopération internationale requiert plus que la signature de traité et va plus loin que les initiatives de coopération dans le domaine du contrôle des armements. Durant plusieurs décennies, le Canada s'est posé comme défenseur des efforts multilatéraux de sécurité. La stratégie de défense, le Canada d'abord met en évidence l'importance d'une telle coopération dans le contexte actuel. It's also a priority for NATO, Mr. Speaker, partnership and cooperation with all of our allies and with countries beyond NATO. Et il est clair que la coopération internationale dans le domaine de la défense demeurera une pierre angulaire de la sécurité du Canada pour les années à venir. And let me contrast this vision of security, Mr. Speaker, with many partners, yes, the United States here in North America, but dozens in NATO, dozens outside of NATO that have active security cooperation with Canada, with what the member for Toronto Centre said about this government responding to some kind of imperial pressure. Well, Mr. Speaker, I look around me to Europe, south of the border, to Asia, I fail to see, and I think all of us on this side of the House fail to see, Mr. Speaker, in this day and age, an imperial power to which Canada would subordinate itself in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and it's for that reason, Mr. Speaker, that we will continue to remind this House and Canadians that we are speaking about today's reality, not about the anxieties of the 1920s or the 1950s, not about something of historical interest, but about Canada's security reality today, our partnerships in the world, our cooperation in the world, and our arms control and disarmament obligations in the world. Monsieur le Président, comme je l'ai déjà mentionné, la coopération internationale dans le domaine de la sécurité comporte plus que des traités. Elle englobe des domaines comme la recherche collaborative, le développement, l'entraînement, le partage du renseignement et les opérations conjointes. Les efforts aident, ces efforts aident les forces armées canadiennes à protéger la sécurité du Canada, car... Dans le monde complexe d'aujourd'hui, les pays ne peuvent contrer la plupart des menaces à eux seuls. Dans cet environnement volatile, le Canada dispose d'un proche allié. Pendant des décennies, les forces canadiennes et américaines ont travaillé côte à côte pour protéger la sécurité de nos deux pays et pour promouvoir la stabilité mondiale. C'est pourquoi, dans la stratégie de défense le Canada d'abord, il est inscrit que les forces armées canadiennes ont le devoir de renforcer sa coopération de longue date en demeurant un partenaire solide et fiable dans la défense de l'Amérique du Nord. And, and I might as well just ask here, Mr. Speaker, does the member for Toronto Centre know the history of his own party, which was 
because it was the Liberal Party of Canada that brought us into the North American Aerospace Defense Agreement, where we are the smaller partner, yes, but for the larger objective of defending North America. And we did that of our own free will. This government supports that alliance as much as any Liberal government did. But it's not a question of ceding sovereignty. It's a question of defending peace, defending one's national interest more effectively with allies, and we've always done it. La stratégie fait aussi appel aux forces pour qu'elles co coopèrent avec nos partenaires et alliés, y compris les États-Unis, afin d'encourager la sécurité internationale. Notre collaboration de longue date avec nos amis américains a porté fruit au fil des années. Elle nous a permis d'accéder à des informations importantes, de dialoguer avec les décideurs clés, d'améliorer nos propres capacités mili euh, militaires et a permis à nos industries de la défense de collaborer de façon plus efficace and of course to export to the United States and beyond. Mr. Speaker, this is a relationship worth preserving. Doing so was a priority for Canada during the negotiation of the Convention on Cluster Munitions. That's why Canada championed a clause within the Convention dealing with the military cooperation of signatory states with countries that are not party to the agreement, countries like the United States. This clause, found in Article 21 of the Convention and reflected in Bill S-10, strikes a fair balance between humanitarian principles on the one hand, to which we are absolutely committed, and Canada's security imperatives on the other. It protects Canada's ability to cooperate in a meaningful way with its partners who have not yet signed the agreement. And it complies entirely with Canada's humanitarian obligations under the Convention. Mr. Speaker, perhaps that's something that needs reinforcing. Despite all the rhetoric from across the way, we are complying entirely with the requirements of the Convention. The legislation before us today reflects Canada's interpretation of this clause and as such will allow us to remain fully interoperable with the U.S. military. It will preserve the valuable liaison and exchange positions that the Canadian Armed Forces share with our most important ally. It essentially means, Mr. Speaker, that Canadian, in combat, Canadian forces would not be obliged to leave U.S. units just because there was a suspicion that cluster munitions might be used. Of course, Canadian members of Canadian forces would not use them would not be directly involved. Of course, our units would never use them. That would violate our obligations under the Convention. But should we leave our US colleagues hanging in Afghanistan, in some other combat mission, just because of the possibility of a legal stricture not having been met? The fact is, interoperability between our two nations remains essential to Canada's defense and security. It's more important now in 2013 than ever before, Mr. Speaker where every dime counts, every soldier counts, every capability needs to be leveraged here, within NATO, in every operation around the world. Article 21 of the Convention, reflected in Bill S-10, will also give our men and women in uniform the legal protection they need to continue to cooperate with other non-signatory states without fear of being disciplined or put on trial. This includes when they're participating in combined military operations, multinational exercises, training opportunities, and military cooperation away from the battlefield. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, that this kind of cooperation is integral to the work of our military. Mr. Speaker, that all being said, this will not take away from our commitment to fulfill all of our obligations under the Convention. The Canadian Armed Forces will, at all times and during all operations, continue to remain bound to these obligations, to prohibit the authorization of or participation in any indiscriminate attack, including one using cluster munitions, regardless of whether they acted independently or with foreign partners. Put simply, no Canadian Armed Forces member will ever directly use a cluster munition or specifically ask that one be used in circumstances where the choice of munition used is within the exclusive control of the Canadian Armed Forces. In fact, as we move forward with implementation, the Chief of the Defence Staff will issue additional directives to ensure this is fully enforced in practice. These military directives will specifically prohibit Canadian military members on exchange with Allied Armed Forces from using cluster munitions or from giving or receiving training in their use. They will also prohibit the transportation of cluster munitions by the Canadian Armed Forces or by third parties under their control. And my question, our question to the opposition is, Mr. Speaker, how are these safeguards somehow insufficient? And how does the opposition think that with their self-righteousness tonight, they can wish away the reality of a different policy in the United States, a country that happens to be our most important ally? These restrictions, which will be implemented as soon as Canada ratifies the agreement, will actually exceed the Convention's requirements. So let me conclude. Wherever they operate, the Canadian Armed Forces abide by their national legal and humanitarian obligations. Their obligations under the Convention are part and parcel of that cross-cutting commitment. 
Indeed, as I said at the outset, national defense has already prohibited the use of cluster munitions in our own operations. We've removed them from active service. We've taken all the necessary steps to destroy our remaining stockpile. Going forward, Canada remains steadfast in its commitment to the ratification of the Convention on Cluster Munitions and to its ultimate universalization. What does that mean, Mr. Speaker? It means we want all countries to become states party to this convention, including the United States. And we will engage in advocacy, we will engage in outreach, we will engage in diplomacy to that goal. We recognize that in doing so, we reinforce our broader efforts to foster domestic international security. We also realize that this commitment to our collective security can only be undertaken in close cooperation with partners and allies, some of which have not yet signed the convention. So with that in mind, until such time that the goal of universalization is realized, the legislation before us today strikes the necessary balance to ensure that we remain true to our obligations under the Convention, while enabling us to remain a strong and reliable partner in the quest for peace and security, both at home and abroad. As such, I call upon my honourable colleagues to support this important legislation so that we can take the next steps in the crucial, critical phase of implementation. And Mr. Speaker, let me just close with two personal points. We are living in a dangerous world. Uh, and I do personally have an experience of cluster munitions from that most recent theater of combat for the Canadian forces, Afghanistan. The exception that is being provided for in this legislation is not an abs abstraction, Mr. Speaker. It's not something that we should be arguing about legalistically on blackboards. It's something that is really needed. When we were walking in the hills and valleys of Afghanistan more than once uh, during my time in that country, there were moments when one would take a step over some boulders, look across uh, a divide in what seemed to be a remote place, but a place where sheep and people and shepherds and travelers would nevertheless pass. And there they were, the cluster munitions that had been left, in some cases by the Soviet Union, in some cases by the United States. And I was never a direct witness to the atrocious human tragedies that these remnants of war, explosive remnants of war, left on Afghan families, on Afghan villages. Fortunately, those traveling with me always managed to see them, to step away, to miss these little tennis ball si sized balls of destructive power. But they were used, Mr. Speaker, not just by countries that we would have once considered our enemies, like the Soviet Union, not only by China with its growing military power, but by the United States. We may regret that use. That use nevertheless happened. I guarantee you, Mr. Speaker, that it happened in units where Canadians were either actively embedded or had been embedded before and or before or afterwards would be embedded. It would be a shame. It would, in fact, be outrageous, Mr. Speaker, given the dependence that we have had on the United States for partnership in the military field and that NATO has had on the United States in the military field in Afghanistan and elsewhere, for us to be refusing that kind of fellowship, that kind of professional development, that kind of involvement because U.S. soldiers are also embedded in our units, simply because one particular weapon may have been used on a few occasions in Afghanistan. And believe me, Mr. Speaker, I don't have cases, and we studied them a lot uh, in the United Nations mission elsewhere in Afghanistan, in which cluster munitions were used mistakenly against civilian targets. I hope they were not. These munitions that we found in the mountains had been left there by pilots discharging their load as they headed back to their aircraft carrier, to their base, thinking that they'd been destroyed, thinking that no one would come to harm. And there is a legacy there of explosive armaments of war that needs our attention. It has received attention. Canada has been one of the foremost countries funding demining programs, funding the destruction of unneeded ammunition in huge quantities in Afghanistan to try and make this war-torn country safer. But we should not encumber ourselves with an absolutely ridiculous obligation to cut off our cooperation 
with the United States, our ability to embed with U.S. units simply because the United States on this issue happens to be in a different place. We would argue behind us in terms of adherence to the convention, but according to its own decision making, according to on the basis of its own sovereignty for its own, uh, given its own military role in the world. So Mr. Speaker, we on this side hope for passage of this legislation. We hope for understanding. We know Canadians want that partnership with the United States to continue. We hope the opposition will understand, especially the Liberal Party, that by continuing the kind of rhetoric they've displayed tonight, they are really kind of going against a decision that they took. That uh, brings to an end the, uh, the time allocated for the first presentation. Uh, questions and comments? Kassian Kamanta, the Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I listened with great interest to the Parliamentary Secretary, and uh, he used some pretty loaded language. Uh, he said that the opposition was hypocritical, and then he talked about self-righteousness. Um, but listening to the debate, I could only surmise that um, the, the self-righteousness is actually coming from that particular member. And I know he believes that he knows a lot, but the fact is, is that we all look at legislation, and we have basic questions that we want to address. And so to call to characterize this as uh, self-righteous or hypocritical, I mean, this is very unparliamentary, Mr. Speaker, because I think there are basic questions that need to be asked. And one of them is, uh, why did it take so long for this legislation to come forward? The convention was signed in 2008. Um, it, it, uh, uh, it took four years for it to come forward, and all of a sudden it's being jammed through, rushed through at the last minute, which of course is a pattern with this government, but it's, it's, it's very disturbing. And I guess the most basic question is, how can the government um, stand up to any credibility by ratifying or by passing this legislation and, and call it a ratification of the convention when in actual fact examination of this bill would suggest that it's undermining the convention and if you if you uh, heed the words of the former negotiator Mr. Turcotte I mean he that's what he says in effect so uh, leave aside the self-righteousness why, why not just address some of the questions that are legitimately coming forward about this bill Secretary Thank you Mr. Speaker well Leaving aside the term that the member opposite has just used, uh, let's open up the debate a little bit wider. H how is it, Mr. Speaker, that the NDP, the party opposite, uh, would w even weigh in on this debate, which relates to a necessary balance that we as a government are seeking to strike, believe we have struck in this legislation between our disarmament obligations, which are run very deep in this country, and our obligations as an ally, where interoperability isn't an option, Mr. Speaker. It's something that is codified in the very DNA of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's something without which a mission like Libya would never have happened. A mission like Afghanistan would never have happened. The defense of North America, the defense of Europe, the naval operation in the Arabian Sea would not happen. Not just without interoperability, but without the ability to exchange officers, sailors, air crew, soldiers. How does the NDP even deign to rise and comment on this debate when every time legislation comes forward, budgets come forward, debate comes forward in this House on giving equipment, funding, training, even approving missions for the Canadian Armed Forces, they are against, Mr. Speaker. The No Defense Party is here. Questions and comments? Kassin Kamantaya, the Honourable Member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What we've been hearing is beneath debate in the House. I'm really, really disappointed with the way this is being dealt with, that we're disabled from talking about the principle of humanity that underlies this treaty and how it relates to this exalted principle of interoperability that you seem to reify, that the member seems to reify, that's absolutely nuts. I'm going to quote back to the member what he said about when he's criticizing the Liberals. That, quote, in the heat of combat, they wanted the best for our troops, unquote. Then he goes on to say how they sent troops into battle under-equipped. And he used that to say that somehow or other they'd lost their way and that they were being hypocritical. Frankly, the whole way that that played out read to, sounded to me just like a defense of the, the actual use 
of cluster munitions. So could the parliamentary secretary please, please confirm one, that two. he actually is not in a veiled way defending the use of cluster munitions through this exaltation of the principle of interoperability. It sounded like it to me. I'm a parliamentary secretary to the Minister of National Defense. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I am certainly not in any way advocating the use of cluster munitions. If the member had been listening to my remarks, he would have known my only involvement with cluster munitions in Afghanistan was to try not to be a victim of them. And it is this government that is bringing in legislation to make Canada a state party to this convention, which we were not at the time of combat in Afghanistan. The convention having only been formulated four and a half years ago. The real question, Mr. Speaker, is why the member for Toronto Danforth, the member for Vancouver East, really show absolutely no respect, not only for our military, but for our main ally, which does who does play a role in the security of North America and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, indeed in anchoring peace and stability in the world. And I'd like the member, if he gets up sometime tonight, to say that he believes in NATO, that he believed in the mission in Afghanistan, that he believes in our alliance with the United States, because quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, we don't hear it from the NDP very often. We know many of them, through the history of the CCF and the NDP, were committed to taking Canada out of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to having no military relations to speak of with the United States. And that's the kind of thing we're hearing tonight with this sanctimonious rhetoric, this disregard, wanton disregard for interoperability. And it was the member for Vancouver East that first called my speech, which was at least an attempt to be substantive on the issue, unparliamentary. Are they suggesting that we shouldn't discuss military and security topics in this House? Because that's certainly what it sounds like to us, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. <clears throat> Questions and comments. Yes, uh, come on, the honourable member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the member, the member asked uh, what might have been a rhetorical question. I don't know how how it is that the NDP could weigh in on this debate. And I just wanted to uh, remind uh, my honourable colleague that uh, our party was the only party in this house that that opposed Canada's mission in Afghanistan, and that position was. That position was supported by over 50% of the Canadian population. Four million, over 4 million Canadians voted for us in the last election. That's why we're here, and that's why we have every right to debate this issue in the House, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> the, the member uh, uh, said that uh, the U.S. was you know, perhaps in a different place than, than Canada is on this treaty. And, and let's just put it in perspective. There's, there's Four billion cluster bombs stockpiled around the world. The United States has a quarter of those. And they're not just in a different place, Mr. Speaker. They're in a different universe. And what this member's uh, trying to say to us today, tonight, is that, uh, listen, we don't have any, any uh, right to question uh, their position. We just have an obligation to listen and adhere to their position. And we're saying here, and we're actually saying it very clearly, A, we support the treaty, lock, stock, and barrel. We do not support a, a way in which uh, our uh, position in the world is somehow compromised by this clause on interoperability. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the member for Davenport says that we on this side do whatever the Americans tell us to do. Well, Mr. Speaker, I have news for him. He clearly hasn't been following the debate. The Americans aren't signing this convention. We've signed the convention. We're ratifying it. It's a sovereign decision by a conservative government, and it's a good decision, Mr. Speaker. And secondly, Mr. Speaker, he says that the United States of America, and I think this one is really one for the record books, is in a different universe. What universe is that, Mr. Speaker, that the member for Davenport is talking about? Is it the universe that doesn't include a country across the Niagara River, a closest ally with whom we do $2 billion of business a day, with whom the city he represents is integrated culturally, socially, economically, in every possibility. He calls that a different universe? What greater measure, what greater indicator of lack of respect for the United States, its role in the world, its role as an ally in security, in military affairs, could there be to then to say that they're in a different universe, Mr. Speaker? And I would like to close simply by 
reminding the NDP that with their position opposing the mission in Afghanistan, the combat mission in Afghanistan, they join a grand total of zero governments of NATO countries. There were no NATO countries that failed to deploy to Afghanistan. They would have been the only one, Mr. Speaker, and that's why they're not fit to govern. They won't govern, and this government will do everything in its power to, to point out their absolute bankruptcy on these issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.